Good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon and good evening, depending on where you are, I suppose. And welcome to my Creative Contessa uh, live Q&A for my travel adventures. So um, question, I suppose, is does anyone have any specific questions? I actually asked in advance and I have a couple of uh, interesting ones. But remember, if you have questions, just put them in the chat and I will keep my eye on that. So if I'm ever looking, looks like I'm looking off screen. I'm not, I'm looking at hopefully your input and your comments. Um, so I'm actually right now in Korea. I am north of Seoul in a, a polity a municipality called Dongducheon. I'm actually very, very close to the DMZ. Um, and some people often ask me, does that make your life exciting or is that scary or is that intimidating and it really actually isn't. Koreans are not really concerned with North Korea coming down over the border. We're not concerned with it either. North Korea couldn't really sustain a, a war anyway. That may change if someone decides to, someone with more power and resources decides to back North Korea, but that's currently not the case. And um, so Korea itself is an amazing country. It's absolutely beautiful. I cannot recommend it highly enough as a travel gem. Um, we currently mostly go out on the weekends uh, because my husband is active duty U.S. military. We also frequently um, get a four-day weekend once a month. And so we'll take that four-day weekend and we'll go spend it somewhere else along the Korean peninsula. Uh, thanks to the public transit network here, there's fantastic trains, there's fantastic buses, super affordable. So it's really easy to get around without a car. Uh, taxis are also part of the public transit network and are also highly affordable. So we don't have a car here. We don't want a car here. We don't need a car here. Um, our most recent trip was actually down to Gyeongju. And that is an amazing, basically, outdoor museum. It's uh, was the capital of the Shila Empire, which at one point united the entire Korean peninsula under one monarch, under one, under one dynasty. And they were known in Japan as the Kingdom of Gold. <laughs> and they were, the, with good reason, they were master gold workers. And Gyeongju is uh, covered in pyramid-sized burial mounds, pyramid-sized tumuli, graves, basically these massive hill graves, and each of those graves contained, or still contains, a burial with priceless artifacts. And I mean hundreds, millions of dollars worth of gold in today's money, uh, entire living sets, so all the pottery that someone could need in the afterlife, rich clothing, accoutrement, saddlery for their horses, weapons, their crowns, their royal regalia. They basically buried all the wealth of each person or a good chunk of the wealth of each individual with them in these tombs. And so you can actually go to Yongju and walk around these impressive uh, odes to, to the past. And there's even one grave, uh, hill grave, that you can enter, you can go into it. And they, after they excavated it, they set it back up again to be a museum that you could enter and actually go and see the grave itself, which they've reconstructed in the way in which they actually found it. So you can see what the archeologists saw, and which, you know, is never, not, not, it's never what you see in the museum. The museum pieces are always polished and cleaned and, and put back together, reassembled. So what you see in the in the actual excavation itself is not that, but this particular um, museum, it's um, Chong Ma Chon, which means the heavenly horse grave. You can actually see what the archaeologists saw, and that's to me that's really remarkable. Um, so you can not only see what the archaeologists saw, but they have a lot of the pieces have been um, have been reconstructed so that you can see them what they look like new. And they've been made by uh, really master craftsmen in Korea. And they filmed the process of making each item. And you can actually see step by step each item being made by these master craftsmen working with only as much as possible, only historically accurate tools, reconstructed tools. And you can watch you know, a piece of leather go from a piece of leather to a saddle mud flap or a piece of uh, the layers that it takes to make a saddle mud flap out of birch 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 bark and then um, 
Raimi, which is a nettle cloth, and then the painting and the gilding. And yeah, it's, it's really a fantastic site. So Gyeongju is filled with sites like that. There's the, the museum that's been uh, erected in a in a grand but traditional looking style where all this gold that they found has been placed. And, oh wow, look at those bags in my eyes. Sorry, they just got up here on my time. Where all of, all of that gold has been placed and all of the finds from a lot of these graves. And so you can go in and see them, but they've, they have all these interactive exhibits and um, they've also built this beautiful grounds around the museum in Gyeongju that, that, recreates the sense of what the city of Gyeongju was when it was the capital of the Shila Empire. Unfortunately, it doesn't look like it did uh, 1400 years ago, 1500 years ago, but they're slowly reconstructing bits of it so that you can get a sense of it. And there's still lots of, of beauty. Right now, Gyeongju is absolutely covered in um, lotus blossoms. They have planted fields and fields and fields of lotus blossoms and lotus blossoms are in bloom right now. And so the, the sense of beauty and elegance and peace because lo lotus blossoms bloom during the day, they're day bloomers. So, you know, the fields of pinks and whites are just open all around. So as you're walking around this open air museum, there's these gorgeous flowers everywhere. And for those who don't know, lotus blossoms are um, in Buddhism, they're a symbol for the human soul. They're a metaphor for the human soul because lotus blossoms are these gorgeous flowers, but they flourish in absolutely filthy water. And the idea is that the human soul can flourish even if its environment is absolutely um, execrable. And for those who don't know, lotus blossoms are, they're, they're the lily pads, right? The, the frogs typically sit on in, in Western, in the Western idea and a lot of Western uh, parables of, of animals. And, you know, those lilies, those are the, those are the lotuses. So, you know, Monet's water lilies, for instance. And Gyeongju is just absolutely covered in them. What that also means though, is that at nighttime, Gyeongju is very loud because frogs love lotus blossom plantations because they're marshes. They're, they're water plants. And so if you want to go frog uh, watching <laughs> or frog dodging, then Gyeongju is the place for you. Um, so we recently spent a four-day weekend there and we stayed in a traditional Korean hanok. And if you're in Korea, I absolutely recommend staying in a traditional Korean hanok. These are those, they're the traditional style homes, the pre-Korean War, pre, um, you know, pre-Westernization structures and they're beautiful. They're timber, they're timber frame with, you know, wattle and daub fill in. So, you know, there's, they kind of, they have a European, they're the European cousins, uh, but the construction styles developed parallel. So it's not, they, Korea did not get wattle and daub structures, the construction techniques from Europe that that's something they developed on their own. And so if you're traveling in Korea, I highly recommend looking up when you do a hotel search, search for Hanok, H-A-H-A-N-O. I'm going to type that here in the comments. Hanok, you can see. Do a search for Hanok or Hanok stay. And you can actually tell by the picture if it's a traditional Korean Hanok or not. And there, there are tons of them now, hundreds of them across the country, if not maybe thousands at this point. Because over the last 10 years, people have had the money to invest in building these kinds of structures, tearing down the old post-war buildings that were really shanty-like and, and dangerous in some cases. So tearing down all of those unsightly, in you know, very unpleasant buildings and building these gorgeous hanok and turning them into bed and breakfast. So the owner still lives in it. And then you get to go and stay in, in one of the many rooms that they now have. And they have the central courtyard and the ones in Gyeongju, some of them are massive. And so they have these big, beautiful courtyards that are landscaped in, in a very charming fashion. And there's places to sit outside and, and um, just enjoy the natural surroundings that Gyeongju has to offer, and the peace and quiet of the countryside. Yeah, Gyeongju, of course, has an entirely modern city that is, is kind of separate from this or away from the historic area. And, you know, that's so if you want to see what real Korea is like, you can do that too. And there's tons of restaurants and whatnot. But the historic part is the part where we spend most of our time and we just absolutely love it. And it um, they've they illuminated at nighttime really beautifully and they they've have 
traditional Korean music piped in from speakers from the trees. So as you're walking through these enchanted forests or these hill grave parks, then you're just, you know, inundated with this mystical light and this mystical music and the peace of the night. So that's, yeah, my, if, if you only go to one place in Korea, honestly, people always say, oh, I want to go to Seoul. Well, okay. But honestly, I think Yeongju is a much better, a much better place to go and visit. Um, we did recently also spend a bunch of time. We have spent a lot of time in Seoul because we're an hour and 20 minutes from Seoul by Metro. And uh, which means it's really easy to go to on the weekend. It's not so much an evening, an evening trip, uh, because that would basically mean we spend most of the evening in the Metro, which is fine. I bring my laptop and I, I video edit usually to and from wherever we go these days. Uh, or, you know, work on the scripts for upcoming videos or that sort of thing. So it's not time wasted for me, but still I don't necessarily want to spend two hours and 40 minutes on the train for an hour or two or three in in the place. But we have been spending a lot of time in Seoul. We've gotten to do a lot of the royal palaces. Um, the On really hot days, we like to go into, the, you know, the National Museum of Seoul is this immense and impressive structure, grounds, it's got gardens, it's got traditional buildings that have been, re have been rebuilt to create a sense of historic Korea. The arc, the exhibits are wonderful and stunning and they've got some really interesting, I'm not normally a big fan of um, hyperactive digitized or digital uh, spectacle exhibits at museums, but Korea has done a really amazing job with it. And they've got an entire part of the museum that is this massive, massive room. The whole room is the screen, is the projection screen. And you sit in the room and they've created all of these, they've animated historic art. And so they've made, you know, 18th century pictures of dancers dance, the exact pictures. And they've turned these mountainscapes with people walking through them into life um, tableau, living tableaus, tableau vivant, actually. They've made They've actually made tableau vivant, but but without actually having to use people to do it. And so you just sit in this room and you're inundated with amazing traditional music and the beauty of of traditional Korean art and architecture. And so you know you you have you have the historic exhibits, the actual artifacts. You have the actual art that you can go upstairs and see, but then you can also experience it in a much more dynamic manner. And while I normally I'm not a huge fan of that, in this case I actually found it to be very enriching. So National Museum in Seoul, absolutely something that you must see if you come to Korea. The Royal Palaces. For those who don't know, the Royal Palaces in Korea, um, in Seoul. There are five, basically, even though one of them is not really, it's not a palace like we understand a palace. It was a royal, it was a royal residence or residence of a member of the royal family, but not the king or the queen. But it's also still there. No one ever goes there. So it's one of the less visited ones. It's really nice and it's right next to all the other palaces. But at Gyeongbokgung, the main palace in Seoul, they have a changing of the guard ceremony there um, at three. PM, no, 2 PM, sorry, 2 PM. 1.30 to 1.45 are drills. And that's interesting to see the traditional Joseon soldiers in their historically accurate uh, uniforms, very colorful, very bright with their weapons, dulled weapons, they're blunted. They don't, they don't have blades anymore, but you see them there um, drilling and they're, it's, you know, it's like a martial dance. It's a martial ballet. And then after the drills, they take a small break. And then at two o'clock, they start the changing of the guard ceremony. And I have a full video on this. If you want to see it, it's posted there. It's, um, I don't think I've posted on my travel channel yet. I will post it on the travel channel. It's currently only on my Creative Contessa channel. Uh, it's called uh, Chang guard, Changing of the Guard at Gyeongbokgung Palace, a medieval martial ballet. It's amazing because it's got medieval instruments blasting this music that was intended to awe and inspire the subjects to convey the power of the royal family and it's got this massive drum and all these soldiers in all their uniforms and the different colors engaged in different choreographies as part of the ritual of of power of the Joseon royal dynasty and so you can witness this every day except for the one day a week when the Gyeongbokgung is closed and I think that might be Tuesday at 2 p.m. and it's they literally have guards posted in the front of the palace so that it's it's a real changing of the guards, even if there's no longer an, a you know a monarchy 
here in Korea. And the royal family is sort of out of the country and doesn't really exist anymore as such. They're still doing, they've started doing this again. They've, in the end of the 90s is when they resurrected the, the ritual. And I think it was in like 2006 when it became a regular feature. So if you're in Seoul, you must see the changing of the guards at Yongbokgung, which is the main, pa main palace, the central palace. It was the first palace built um, by the Joseon dynasty, uh, by Tejo, 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 Tejo the Great in Seoul in like 1398. Once he took power, he re he re relocated the capital to what was in Hanyang, it's now Seoul because uh, many reasons. When you're new dynasty, you sort of you want to continue some of the old dynasty to root your power in some kind of past, but you also want to institute a bunch of new policies and procedures, and that may include a new capital because you want to put your mark on the country. And so he did that by relocating the capital from Kaesong to, to Seoul. And the idea was that, that Kaesong had lost its geomantic power, its feng shui. And so Seoul supposedly according to the rules of geomancy, my new word of the month, by the way, that's what feng shui is in English, geomancy. According to the rules of geomancy, um, you need you need to have specific features in specific places and rivers that flow in mountains that are positioned in a specific way to allow the chi to flow through the area. Key to geomancy. And so soul supposedly have has even to this day the ideal geomancy according to you know the rules of feng shui principles of feng shui and that's why they chose hanyang as the new capital and they positioned the palace uh, yongbokgung to be specific to leverage this to maximal value because there's a stream that cuts right in front of it right along the well, i don't know two or 300 meters in front of it anyway. And there's mountains that frame it behind, you know, on the sides and behind it. And, you know, all of that combined creates the ideal conditions for good energy. So Yongbokgung, an absolute must see, especially at 2 p.m. And for those who don't know, they give free tours in several languages, um, mostly English and Korean, but there's two times a day at any of the palaces in Seoul. There are free English tours. Take it. And even if you've taken it before, take it again. Because what I've noticed by doing these tours multiple times is that each of the tour guides tends to have their own little, uh, little tales, little anecdotes. And sometimes they just present completely different things, different structures than they did before. So even if you've taken one of the tours of the palaces, take it again. Really, highly recommend it. Oh, so the cover came down a little bit. So take it again. It's it's worth it. And um, if it's hot, get a parasol. <laughs> always always carry your own shade. You'll notice lots of Koreans, men and women, not just women, out there with parasols. And sometimes they're just umbrellas. But any extra shade you can get when touring Korea in the summer is absolutely worth it. it might, you might think it looks silly. You're in Asia. It doesn't. Use the parasol. Uh, let's see. Other recommendations I have for visiting Seoul. Oh, the medieval walls. Seoul was a medieval city, Hanyang, before uh, the Korean War. And of course, they built fortifications, defenses around it. And in Asia, in Eastern Asia, you know, in, in Europe, they built like this really close wall that closely circles the city. And Seoul had that. But it also had a wall, the walls, they actually built them up and over the mountains, like the Great Wall of China, for those who aren't familiar with Korean architecture. But the same idea, the Great Wall of China isn't just a Chinese concept of defense structure. Everyone was doing that across Asia, and Korea is no exception. So Seoul actually has 18 kilometers of its medieval walls have been reconstructed because the Japanese destroyed a lot of it. And then the Korean War <laughs> kind of finished what was. Not, had not been destroyed for the most part, but the walls go up and over all the mountains that surround and are in Seoul because there are a couple that are just right in the middle of Seoul. And you can actually walk along these walls most of the way. And it provides you with an unparalleled view of Seoul because you're literally overlooking the city. You're not very far away at all. You, you can get to the walls from metro stops. 
that are downtown Seoul metro stops to give you an idea of how close these walls are to the city. So you can get right up on the mountain, right up on the wall and have this bird's eye view of the city that, that people actually in the, um, you know, in Joseon in earlier centuries would have also been able to have because guards were up there. Monks used to go, people used to go up to the mountains to pray part, as part of Buddhism. And, and some people just, they used to go out for leisure walks in Korea. Leisure, leisure walking, leisure hikes was a thing, especially amongst the, you know, the aristocracy. And so from these medieval city walls, you can actually look down into the palace complexes, which are just from viewed from above are particularly stunning because they have a very Confucian structure to them. And so they're very symmetrical and very geometrical. And there's a, there's a, there's an order to it and there's an elegance to that order. Unlike medieval European castles, which by the way, I love, I love medieval Europe, European architecture, Renaissance architecture, really also my jam. But medieval architecture in Europe can be very haphazard and accidental because it just kind of happens and it's not planned. And most of medieval palaces don't tend to be planned either. They also tend to have just happened and just sort of metastasized over time. But the palaces in Korea were planned. And every time part of them burnt down, they rebuilt it exactly as it was before. There was no, by the Joseon dynasty, there wasn't much in the way of architectural development or growth or creativity. That has its downside. Obviously, you're not going to get fascinating innovations that lead to changes over time and a more varied architecture. On the positive side, that means you can basically know how the palaces looked in 1398 when they were first built, because when they rebuilt them, they didn't change anything at all. What that means is that these palaces are very orderly, and you can see that order from the medieval city walls. Medieval city walls in Seoul, uh, definitely a recommended recommended visit. But note that one of the walls, one of the especially the steepest one, the one will, that will afford you the best view, that is heavily guarded because it backs the Blue House, which is Korea's White House. That is the presidential home. Although it might not be for long, we'll see if that goes through anyway. That means that there are guard shacks all along it, and you have to have a form of ID that they recognize as valid. If you're American, a driver's license is not a valid form of ID. You need to have your passport with you because these guards, heavily armed with automatic rifles, will be checking it. And we found that out the hard way when we planned to go hiking on that part of the wall, and we arrived with our passports and the guards said, or without our passports and the guards asked us for those passports and we didn't have them. So although you're not supposed to carry your passport with you normally, you know, the state department recommends, recommends against that and you might lose it if you're out and about for <laughs> certain mountains in Seoul, you need your passport. Also certain mountains in Seoul. So one of the other stretches of medieval city wall, that mountain closes on Mondays because it apparently needs to rest as one a very amused Korean gentleman told us when we were trying to access that part of the wall. That was a failed day for us. We tried to get the first part of the wall and it was closed. And so we walked along the road at the base of the mountain to the second part. <laughs> and then we didn't have our passport. So we gave up at that point. At that point, we'd already been actually walking for several hours just to get to a medieval city wall and none of them were available to us. That, that was a banner day for us <laughs> for travel. <laughs> Anyway, thankfully, we lived here, lived here then and live here now. So failures like that aren't critical in terms of waste of precious time. Whereas if you're visiting Korea, you might want to make sure that you know that mountains close on Mondays and that you might need your passport for other mountains. Uh, other recommendations for traveling in Seoul. Uh, Bukchon. There are still, even though the war really ravaged, Korea, the Korean War level, most of the traditional architecture, there are certain parts that managed to survive and or have been reconstructed. And there are a, a couple of Hanok villages. So Hanok, again, that's the traditional Korean architecture still in Seoul. And, and you know, maybe just a few Hanok survived originally, but now more have been rebuilt since then. So one of those villages is called Bukchon, and that is located dead center between 
Gyeongbokgung and Cheongdokgung. Those are two, two the, the two primary palaces of Seoul, basically. And Bukchon village has a lot of really nice traditional Korean restaurants. It has a lot of handcraft uh, workshops. So the, the craftsmen work there and they sell their products there. And a lot of artists and art galleries, more modern art. And that's not really, it's not my cup of tea. But if you're a modern art aficionado, then Bukchon has a lot of, a lot to offer you. There are some experience places where you can go and try out traditional handcrafts. Um, there's a lot of street food vendors. There's a couple of organic grocery stores there. And it's just a really charming uh, neighborhood to walk through because you're walking through these narrow alleys and you can get a sense for how Korea was before the war, how it felt like to walk through the streets with all of these hanok with their with their walls lining the streets and sort of overlooking overlooking sort of centuries as you walk through. And it's very hilly. Bukchon, Korea is generally very hilly and Bukchon is also. The really nice part of Bukchon is, you know, pretty vertical. So if you're looking to see really nice, be immersed in the feeling of traditional Korean architecture, walk up a street and you're going to find some really amazing views. And the roof view on that neighborhood, once you get up there and you can look out over the rooftop and see this really historic looking skyline, it's quite stunning. And then um, Jonggu, or is it Jongno? There's another uh, another street you want to go on that's very near the palaces is in Sadong. And again, it's a lot of traditional craftsmen, and you can buy traditional Korean art supplies, traditional Korean so hanji, traditional handmade Korean paper, and calligraphy brushes and fans that you can paint. And there are lots of experience centers there as well. You can you know, try out different different handcrafts for very little money, actually. Um, you can also buy lots of traditional pottery, although it's there are no potters working there anymore. Most of the potters are in Ichon or Yeoju. And so you're, you're going to pay a little bit of a markup there because the items are resold by storefronts there. But it's still interesting to see. There's also a lot of traditional Korean antique vendors in Insadong. And I really love Korean antiques, the style of woodwork. And it's just, I love it. I love the chests and the, the, the day beds and um, the various sorts of cabinets and the shelves. So you can actually buy, you can buy them there. They're not inexpensive because there aren't many that survived the war. Again, this seems to be a recurring theme in my uplifting morning travel Q and A. Um, so yeah, uh, in Sadong, definitely a place. And they also have a, a, often during the day, if you're there at prime time, so to say, they often have traditional, especially on the weekends, they have traditional Korean musical performers, dancers of all different kinds. So you can get the full spectacle. And kind of off to the left as you're walking away from the palace down in Sedong, to the left, there are lots of traditional restaurants um, offering, you know, um, Hanshik, which is, you know, the traditional Korean table d'hote with all the side dishes and multiple main dishes and, you know, multi-course feast, basically. And sort of more left than that of In Sedong is another Hanok village. And it is, it's very windy and definitely not nearly as pretty fight as, as Bukchon. <laughs> And lots of restaurants there, tons, massive variety, lots of cafes. At nighttime, the place throbs with life. It is an amazing experience with, you know, these narrow alleyways. The kitchens are kind of open onto them, but also entrances to the restaurants. And you have the hot burning coals from the barbecue places uh, sitting from the, what the Americans call beef and leaf, charmingly. So you've got the burning hot coals just sitting there on the side of this three foot wide alley. And, you know, you just have to try to not burn yourself on it as you're walking down the street. And somehow, you know, that's where the slightly intoxicated patrons from these restaurants go to smoke their, their cigarettes of shame. Um, and I say that because they treat it that way. Like they sit there and they hide their smoking to try, you know, like you're not going to smell it as you walk by, but they kind of turn away and hunch and, and try to pretend that they're not doing that. But they're doing it right next to these burning hot coals for the, the grills, for the individual table grills. And somehow it seems no one manages to ever burn themselves. It's kind of remarkable. At least I haven't read any cases of it. Probably I, my Google foo is not strong enough because I can't really search much in Korean. 
anyway, so that's another part of Seoul that I really recommend, sort of to the left of Insidong, Uljiro. It's the is the metro stop for that particular part of Seoul. Um, Namsan is another amazing place to get a good view of Seoul, and there's also some of the medieval wall is is up there as well. And you can just walk up to Namsan. It's it is a mountain. I mean, that's what San means in Korean. It means mountain. But for many of you uh, from more mountainous places, you might laugh at it being called a mountain. You might think it's just a hill. But don't be snobby about your mountains. There's an official geogra geographic definition of a mountain, and I don't know what it is offhand. And I don't know if Namsan meets that definition, but to historic Korea, Namsan was a mountain. And it has a, one of those massive uh, towers on it, like, you know, looks very much like the, the tower in Seattle, for instance, even though it's not that tall in of itself, but it has that shape. And you can go up to the top of the tower and then get a really stunning 360 view of Seoul because Namsan is more centrally located than uh, the other parts because Seoul is sort of spread southward. And so a lot of the new parts on the other side of the river because there was nothing there. So it was easy to just build in a completely modern fashion. So Gangnam, for instance, is far away from the historic part of Seoul. It's like a 45 minute metro ride from the historic part of Seoul. Seoul really sprawls. It's a big, it's a big city. And you know, I could I could provide you with recommendations for days. There's just there's an endless number of neighborhoods and endless cafes endless outdoor art and murals and walking opportunities. You know, there's Hongdae, which is one of the university neighborhoods that's very vibrant and thriving and has a lot of different sorts of restaurants. There's a chocolate place there called Celsius 17 or Celsius 18. I don't remember. It's been a while since I've been there, but it's a really used to be, I don't know if it's still there. I hope it made it through the pandemic. An amazing chocolate shop and there's animal cafes there, of course. Unfortunately, a lot of animal cafes are very unethical and treat their animals horribly. So maybe you shouldn't actually patronize most animal cafes. The cat cafes are nice, though, because kitties, kitties do well in a cafe sort of environment, whereas maybe wild animals like wallabies and meerkats are not meant for cafe life. And if you're wondering what an animal cafe is, look it up. It's basically a place where they have animals of a specific sort and you can interact with the animals. And usually there's not much in the way of the cafe. It's not really about the drink. It's about interacting with the animals. So basically it's an indoor petting zoo is what it comes down to. And some of these places have, like I said, wallabies and Arctic foxes and genets and meerkats and other small wild kitties. And um, some of them have raccoons and meerkats. And so, you know, a lot of those animals don't do well as indoor animals. And I can't really imagine that they have, it's downtown Seoul, in inner city Seoul. So I don't imagine that there's outdoor spaces for them. So, you know, while it's, it's neat to be able to go and interact with these animals, you might otherwise never get to see, it's probably not really the most ethical thing to support them. Kitty cafes, though, tend to be, sometimes are often rescue rescue operation. So these kitties are rescues and the cafe kind of supports the rescue. And for a lot of, a lot of uh, city dwellers, they don't have pets. They don't necessarily live in a place where a pet is a viable option. And so a cat or a dog cafe is a good way to kind of get your, 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 your fur baby time. Uh, you know, maybe you just have to do your own individual research to figure out if an, any given animal cafe is actually an ethical operation practicing good animal husbandry and providing a real resource for abandoned or abused animals, or if it's just an exploitive operation. I know. I wish all animal cafes were actually nice, friendly operations that treated their animals perfectly, but that's not the majority of the cases, as my research has shown me. Anyway, Hongdae has lots of animal cafes because it's also this university area, so lots of young people who are much friendly, have a much more animal-friendly attitude Older generations in Korea and many countries in the world actually still treat animals or view animals as a as a resource, as automatons, as possessions, as livestock. They don't view them as cre sentient creatures with their own, you know, needs and feelings and right to a comfortable life and to not be abused at any rate. And and so older people are not necessarily interested in interacting with animals in that sort of way, which is why 
in any given Asian city, animal cafes tend to concentrate in younger parts of the city where younger people tend to congregate. And Hongdae is another such neighborhood in Seoul. Um, some of you also asked uh, about flying. <laughs> I've been doing a lot of flying lately. And uh, let's see, in the last eight, 10 months, what, what month is it, seven? In the last 10 months, I've definitely put quite a few air miles under my belt. In fact, in the last year, I've put a lot of air miles under my belt. And flying is a very interesting and chaotic experience these days because the airlines are constantly amending their flight schedules. And so on any given booking, I get at least three notifications that the flight has been changed. You know, I have to confirm that that schedule is acceptable. For the most part, it's often the schedule changes by a minute or two, but sometimes, and especially with American Airlines, it's been a question of the schedule changing massively and not in my favor, actually. When I book when I book my flights, if I have a layover, layover, I book it so that I have a specific amount of layover time, usually so that I can enjoy a little bit of re re repose at a lounge at any given airport, but also so that I have enough time to make my flight. And also if I have some kind of non-related connector on the other end, then I want to have time to do that. And so if you get one of these schedule changes from an airline, you have rights. You, you are not obligated to accept it. If they change the schedule, they owe you a full refund, full refund, if that flight is not acceptable. Keep that in mind. And also, they owe you a free change to a time of your preference. So all you have to do is call. Sometimes you can do these changes online. Some of the airlines, it's very convenient. You can just choose a new flight online. Others, you have to make a phone call. And with American Airlines, I don't remember if I had to make a phone call. I think I had to, I, I think I had to make a phone call actually. Um, and I was able to actually get a flight that was even more appropriate to my initial intention of having a nice layover in Charlotte specifically, and still getting to Dulles to connect to catch my Turkish Airlines flight in plenty of time. I just had to make the phone call because otherwise they were going to give me 20 minutes in Charlotte to, to transfer. Hello. And they pushed me way back so that I would have had almost no time to make my connection in, um, in in Seoul. Good morning. Oh, it's it's John Phil. Hi, John Phil. Nice to see you. So yeah, if your airlines try to change your flight, you have rights. Remember that. In fact, Korean Air has changed my upcoming flight to New York. I don't know so many times. Oh, John Phil, you should watch the the recording up to this point because I talked only about Korea. <laughs> um, and. And, and also remember that if they change your flight, um, that in, let's say let's say you're flying and they change your flight, then like you're already you're already en route and they change your flight, then they might owe you an overnight in a hotel, right? Especially if you don't make your connection, that's on them. That's not your fault. That's them for not scheduling a good enough connection for you if they change it. Now, if you choose a flight with a tight connection and you don't make your connection. Yeah, that's on you. Unfortunately, you're going to have to pay for a hotel if you don't make it. But if they change it and you don't make your connection, then that's on them. And then they'll give you a hotel. Um, let's see. Uh, June Pill, did you have any questions for me this morning? Afternoon, evening? It's kind of evening where you are, I guess. Uh, let's see. Um other other questions people had about about flying. Oh, so most of the flying I do transoceanic. I don't I don't pay for those tickets in cash. I mean, I pay for the taxes and fees, but most of those are points. Those are those are all reward points. Some of them are frequent flyer points that I've actually earned from flying, but most of them are reward points from various sorts of credit cards. So, you know, I have a lot of, of these reward travel cards that come with massive sign-up bonuses if you spend $5,000 in three months. And then you get 60,000 to, in some cases, 150,000 award points. And um, I have a bunch of those cards and I've just banked those points over the years. And, and then I use, I transfer those to an airline, to an airline's loyalty program. And I use those points to buy frequent flyer tickets, reward tickets or award tickets in business and first class. And that's how I've been doing most of this flying. Occasionally I will, 
I will, if the tickets are actually, if the cost of the ticket is low enough, I will pay cash for it. But if, you know, the tickets are expensive as a revenue ticket, then I use my points. So that flight, all the flights I made recently on Turkish Airlines from and to Korea, those were all reward points. And, and also a combination, Turkish Airlines was offering a sale on reward tickets, which was remarkable. And they, so um, they offered a special and then a sale on top of the special. So they were offering, it was 66,000 points one way from Seoul to Washington DC in their business, in their, their signature business class. And then they were offering 30% off reward bookings at the same time. So I managed to book round trip which is absolutely insane. Round trip business class for 88,000 points on Turkish Airlines because I kept my eye on their promotional offers and then on their point sales. So if you play the game right, you can really get good value out of your regular daily credit card spend. I never spend more than I actually have. I always make sure I pay my credit cards off at the end of every month. And you know, I just keep my eye on the, the various frequent flyer offers. And that's how you can jet around the world in business or first class for almost no money. So that's that's how I've been doing it. I do not like shelling out thousands of dollars for a ticket if I don't have to. Um, I wanted to comment on a new product that's out there for flying, and that's the premium select product. So we're almost back, we're back to a four-class system on, on, Ameri on a lot of American carriers now. And even some European carriers have now maybe a five-class system, actually, in the case of Air France. So in the case of American Airlines, a lot of them got rid of their international first-class product, and they were just offering a business-class product. But now, carriers like Delta have a business-class product that's actually, they call it Delta One. They like to present it as a first-class. It's, it's more of a business-class product compared to its peers. So we've got Delta One, which is really a business class product. And then they had premium economy and then main cabin. So there were three classes, but now they've introduced premium select on select tr transoceanic flights, particularly long haul ones. And premium select is basically what business class was 20 or 30, 30 years ago, 20 or 30 years ago. And so they're back to this four class system. So premium select tickets are not cheap. Um, if, if a round trip, Delta One, say from Korea to the United States, is four to five thousand dollars. Premium Select will usually run about twenty five hundred to three thousand dollars, and you know you have to decide: is twenty five hundred to three thousand dollars worth a kind of seat that was business class twenty or thirty years ago? So, like the recliner seats, they have a leg rest that comes up a little bit, and the seat reclines about this much, so you get kind of this sort of experience. Um, and the food is a little bit better <clears throat> than main cabin. You get free alcoholic beverages, you know, so premium select. I've seen the product. I don't, I would not pay $3,000 for it. I might pay for a trans, transoceanic flight. I might be willing to pay 1500 round trip for it. Of course, right now, economy class tickets are running $3,000 round trip to and from Korea. So there's been some serious inflation on ticket prices. And that that's a combination of um, oil prices going insane because of greedy oil companies that are still making record profits, but they've just jacked up the prices because they can. There's certainly no shortage. And a combination of so many flights being cut. And so the schedules are all overbooked and that makes demand super high and supply low. And so the airlines are now basically allowed to just charge whatever they want because demand is high enough that they can get away with charging $3,000 per round trip economy class ticket. And the plane is still full. I know this because we just tried booking tickets for my boys. Um, and if we had tried to fly them here on a revenue ticket in June, it would have been $3,500 per child, <laughs> um, whether it was Delta or Asiana or Korean Air, it didn't matter. So we ended up using Space A Military, which is something you can only access if you're active duty or retired military. It worked out for us, so we were able to save a good chunk of money on their tickets here. And we bought one-way tickets for them at the end of August to go back. Fares were way lower for August. And that's another trick. Generally, if you're flying, a round-trip ticket will be less expensive. But, big but, some airlines actually offer one-way tickets cheaper 
than if, if you buy two one-way tickets, it's cheaper than if you buy a round-trip ticket. So sometimes it's worth doing the search both ways, doing a round-trip search and then doing two separate one-ways because sometimes you can leverage the buying the power of two different airlines or the competition between different airlines. So you can get a cheaper one-way ticket on X airline to go to your destination and a cheaper one-way ticket from Y airline to return from your destination. So I always recommend doing any flight searches both ways. Do it as a round trip and then do it as two separate one ways. And sometimes I have found, especially in the last two years, that two separate one ways will get you better value than a round trip for whatever reason, because of the way each individual airline has valued their various fares for various routes. It can work out in your favor to do two separate, two separate one ways. Um, other things I have noticed while traveling lately, airline, airports are packed. They are packed with humanity. And something I've noticed in the United States specifically is that the further north you go, the more people are still wearing masks. <laughs> the further south you go, the fewer people are wearing masks. And you may or may not be aware of this, but masks mostly work to protect other people. <laughs> so if you're the only one wearing a mask, it's not going to be as wonderful for you. It'll be better for them. You're protecting them from your germs. That's why surgeons wear masks, because they're protecting the patient from their germs, not themselves from the patient's germs. Um, but yeah, I did note, I have noticed that people, the further north you go in the United States, the more people are still wearing masks at, on, on, at, at the airports themselves. And depending on where you're flying to, you are still going to have to wear a mask on the plane. The United States, we, no more. But um, in, uh, if you're flying internationally, there are a lot of countries that are still requiring masks on flights because they still are taking a cautious approach to the pandemic, especially as this latest greatest strain of Omicron is spiking. So you need to be aware of the regulations of the country to which you are traveling because they might also still have requirements for COVID vaccinations. And if you don't have a vaccination, they might have a mandatory quarantine on the, on the landing end. And by mandatory, I don't mean that you just get to quarantine yourself. I mean, they will put you in a government facility that you have to pay for for two weeks if you are not vaccinated. So you need to check the requirements of each country to which you're traveling to see what they are. And that changes on a week to week basis. So one week it might be there's, you know, it's all good. Everyone can come in. It's all green. And the next week it might be if you're not vaccinated, you're not welcome here. So check the requirements for each country and don't rely on tertiary third party sites for this. Go to if every country sets up their own you know, their state department sets up their own page for COVID requirements or health requirements, tra travel requirements in general. Go and check and see what the latest guidance on those, those sites are, because otherwise you might end up getting deported or you might just get denied boarding because most airlines are required by the destination country to ensure that passengers comply with all entry requirements before they even get on the plane. And airlines may face fines if they allow passengers on who have not actually met the requirements, the, the essential requirements to enter the country. Now, obviously the airlines might not know if you're on a, you know, some kind of criminal list or something like that, but we're talking about specifically that you have the right visa, um, that you have a visa, that you have the right health certificates if those sorts of things are needed. So most airlines will just deny you boarding if you don't if you don't meet the requirements. And if they deny you boarding because you don't meet the requirements, you don't get a refund on your ticket unless your ticket just happened to have been one of those, those unicorn refundable no matter what tickets. So keep that in mind if you're traveling. Check the COVID restrictions on the country you're going to and the requirements for health. Different countries have different requirements. And, and, and even like within the EU, it's not consistent. France has one set of requirements. Italy has another. Germany has a third. So. Keep that in mind. Very important these days. Um, other things I've noticed while traveling, uh, airlines are slowly returning to serving decent hot food again. Some of them are still highly packaging it as part of their, their COVID prevention uh, stricture. So, you know, every single individual dish will be covered in a plastic tray um, so that whoever, you know, during the transport and during the serving, it wasn't contaminated with germs. And, you know, I'm not, even though it doesn't make the best presentation necessarily, because you have to unpackage everything that's placed before you, I'm not certain that's a bad thing, honestly, and not just for COVID, 
there's other infectious diseases in the world, people. And maybe it's not a bad thing if we don't transmit them to each other quite as regularly. <laughs> um, I'm actually okay with the idea that someone didn't cough or accidentally spit or purposefully spit on my food or touch it with their grubby hands and transfer some touch transmitted disease to me. But that is that is a change. Food, a lot of airlines are still serving food uh, hermetically sealed prepared fresh, but then hermetically sealed and serving it to you that way rather than just sort of, in, if you're in business or first class, the way it used to be is, you know, it was laid out plate by plate. And a lot of, a lot of airlines are now doing a tray format as part of, part of their COVID strictures. And unfortunately, some of them, even though maybe it's no longer necessary for health reasons, some of them are sticking to that because it's easier. So they're using, you know, sort of the downslide during the pandemic of of quality <laughs> um, to cut corners and save on money. Um, and a lot of passengers have been complaining about that though. And, you know, basically saying, well, I'm not going to fly with you again until you go back to what, what we, the quality and caliber that we used to pay for. So some airlines have tossed in the towel on that and decided to just go back to the standard that they should offer and that they used to offer. You know, for example, Delta got during the pandemic, I flew Delta transcontinental a couple of times during the pandemic. And for a Delta one suite from Los Angeles to Boston, where you're supposed to get plated food, multiple courses on fine porcelain, et cetera, six hour flight, they were offering snack boxes, not of quality snacks. I'm not talking organic, individually handcrafted items. I mean, jerky and prepackaged cheese goo and regular crackers. You know, I'm like, wow, this is, I paid, I paid $2,000 for this flight and you're serving me the same junk that you used to serve in economy class as a snack box. So it was very underwhelming. Uh, and I do believe that Delta has finally gone back to hot food service again on, uh, on at least their transcontinental and hopefully on their shorter flights too, because honestly, if you pay a thousand dollars for a ticket for a two hour flight, three-hour flight, they damned well better give you hot food served on porcelain. I mean, really. <clears throat> Other things I've noticed while flying recently, uh, planes are also packed, not just the airports, obviously, maybe it's obvious, I guess, if the airports are packed, the planes are packed, but the planes are packed. They There are no seats. Very rarely have I been on a flight lately where there were empty seats. So no more, no more. And I have flown main cabin a couple of times domestically in the US recently because I wasn't willing to pay the absurd markup for first class. I'm sorry, three hour flight in an American style first class, domestic first class, not worth the money at all. The seats are barely better than the economy class seats. The leg room is barely better. The food is okay, but it's not a thousand dollars okay. So I've been flying back in the back in steerage with everyone else lately. And what I've noticed is that flights are packed back there. There are there's no there's no poor man's econ no poor man's business class as we call it. You know, that wonderful situation where you get a whole row of three seats to yourself and you can just lay down and rest. No. No poor man's business class these days on on flights in the US at any rate. I haven't really flown, I haven't flown at all domestically in Korea this time around, and I haven't been able to get around Asia at all this time around. I'm hoping, hoping to change that soon. I'd like to get back to Hong Kong. I miss you, Hong Kong. I'm so sorry. Oh, God, that breaks my heart. I want to get down to Thailand. I want to get to Chiang Mai finally, but I haven't been able to do that this, on this, on this, this time of being in Korea. So hopefully, hopefully soon-ish. Um, but the Trans transoceanic flights have absolutely been packed. Just every every class of service, full full of humans, people on standby, desperately hoping to get on the plane. And for the most part, um, you know, there's always a couple of dropouts. There's always a couple of no shows. So everyone has made it on board. I've noticed, but there still have been no empty seats because you may or may not know this, ladies and gentlemen. But airlines oversell flights on purpose because that means that they can guarantee that they will have a full flight. That's why if when you check in and I've gotten this I've gotten this notification on every single flight I've taken in the last year. Every single one except for my Turkish Airlines flight. Every flight with an American flight carrier, I have gotten a notification saying when I go to check in, we're looking for volunteers or your flight is very full. We're looking for volunteers to to be bumped. 
um, please let us know how much money it would take for us to bump you. And basically you can bid to be bumped. <laughs> and um, they always go with the lowest bidder. So if you want, if you just want some money and you can wait a day to go to wherever you're going, then go ahead and submit a bid and you might get bumped and you might get some money. And sometimes they'll even put you up in a, depending, they'll put you up in a hotel also will come with that and to put you on a flight the next day or put you out on, on a later flight. Um, I've never been in a place in this last year where that wor worked for my schedule. Oh, sorry. Just touch my laptop screen. That did not work for my schedule at all. I've not taken advantage of the being bumped lately. Um, but it is something they're constantly offering all the time because they're always overbooking their flights because as long if they overbook it, they always, your terms of carriage, you might not realize this, the airline always has the right to bump you. They they must then offer you compensation for doing so, but they always have the right to bump you. And so if you are the last person to check in, if you're the last several people to check in, you uh, especially economy class, not necessarily first class, that's a, that's a different world. But in an economy class, if you're the last person to, last people to check in and they're overbooked and they don't get volunteers, you will be bumped. So this is another reason why the second 24-hour check-in or if, if the airline offers 36-hour advanced check-in opens, check in, check your butt in as soon as possible because the order of check-in determines several different factors. And one of them is whether you will actually be allowed on that flight or not if it's overbooked. That's how they determine it. Sometimes status does play into it as well. If you're a, you know, if you're a, some rare metal, a rare earth metal um, level of status on these airlines, then they might, you, you might not, you might be less likely to be bumped. Some airlines take that into account. Some don't, <laughs> some don't at all. Um, but that, that means that if they don't, then it's the order of check-in that will determine whether you make your flight or not. So check in first, and then you won't get bumped. If you can wait, um, if you have the luxury, the flexibility of your schedule, then go ahead and take the money and get bumped. And you, you know, you get, you get, you get a good deal. Sometimes they're not offering cash though. And keep this in mind. Sometimes they are offering uh, vouchers for future travel. So it's like a win-win for them, right? They're not actually giving you money as such. It's not cash out of their pocket. And so you get a travel voucher for future travel on their on only that airline. So make sure you read the fine print. More often than not lately, it's been a travel voucher. So if it's not an airline you ever plan on flying with again, don't take it. <laughs> if it's a horrible airline, if it's Spirit Airlines or um, Allegiant or one of those other budget carriers that can sometimes provide really awfully, awfully exciting experiences, don't take it. You know, So you keep that in mind. Other things I've noticed about travel lately, uh, full flights, um, they have gone back to even offering snacks and drinks in economy class, yay. Um, and unfortunately, you know, the water tends to be plastic bottled distilled water, which is not really good for you and plastic, you know, it's suboptimal in general. Uh, actually, even in the first and premium, first class and premium economy on US domestic airlines, they're offering wine in glass, in plastic bottles, <laughs> little plastic bottles. Like, wow, wine in plastic bottles. I love it when my wine tastes like plastic particles. So classy. Um, yeah. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> um, otherwise, those were all the questions I really received. What was, what was it? What was my travel life like here in Korea in general? It's great. <laughs> uh, if you're just, if you tuned in late, then, you know, check out the earlier part. i I wax rhapsodic about Korea pretty heavily and provide some travel suggestions. Not all of them. It would take multiple hours for me to really delve into everything I would see here in Korea. I guess, I guess, you know, someone actually asked for like a seven day itinerary. And if this, if you only had seven days in Korea forever and you were never going to get to come back, like I would recommend it would be a itinerary from hell, but it would be great. You'd be exhausted by the end of it, but you would have experienced a lot. I'd recommend two days in Seoul, um, a day in Gyeongju, uh, or two days in Gyeongju, a day in Busan, and, and a couple of days in Jeju Island, for instance. And, you know, Busan is this amazing city to the south. And, oh, and then there's Jeonju. See, there's too much. There's too much beautiful here in Korea to do in seven days. <laughs> 
yeah, Jeonju, I'd recommend Jeonju too, because that's a wonderful historic city. You know, that's the home, the heart of the of the Joseon dynasty. That's where the Joseon, the E clan comes from that founded the Joseon dynasty. They're from they're from Jeonju and their ancestral shrine, their main ancestral shrine is down there. And um you know, it's it's this place where the the Hanok were not destroyed magically during the war, and so you can visit a traditional Hanok style village like it like it's very rarely found anywhere else in Korea, and you know that's wonderful and amazing. And you know, Bim Bim Bop is also that's Jeonju. So there's so much to see in Korea. <laughs> well, Jeonju is worth introducing, Shinfil. It really is. So I would put Jeonju on my seven-day itinerary. So my revised seven-day itinerary is, and it's going to keep getting revised here if I keep talking, but it is two days in Seoul, a day in Gyeongju, a day in Jeonju, a day in Busan, and a couple of days in, um, and then maybe take the overnight ferry over to Jeju, and a couple of days in Jeju, and then just fly from Jeju connecting flight straight to, straight back to Seoul to connect to wherever you're going home again. That would be my, that would be my turbo Korea itinerary. Um, and what you might see at each of those individual places, God, that's, that's a whole other, a whole other Q and A. Um, but that would be my, my recommended seven day itinerary for Korea if you do it. Well, I guess that brings this journey full circle. So if there are no other questions, I thank everyone for joining me for today's travel Q&A. Uh, if you have questions for further Q&As, just let me know in the comments under this video. Um, otherwise, I hope everyone has a lovely morning, afternoon, evening, and or night, and that your travels are creative. Bye, everyone. Mm -hmm. Checking the comments.